God is up to something bigger, and He wants us to be a part of it. God's up to something bigger in this world, and He wants us to be a part of it. That's what we've been looking at and talking about through the month of October. Uh, we began by looking at the story of Joseph. God was up to something bigger in Joseph's life. His brother sold him into slavery because they meant it for evil, but God was doing something greater, and Joseph joined that. And we saw through the story of Joseph that if you live with that conviction, it changes how you go through trials. A couple weeks ago, we looked at the story of Daniel. Daniel was convicted, uh, convinced that God was up to something bigger. And so as he lived in a culture that was uh, full of unbelievers and resistance to believing in the one true God, it empowered him to engage that world because he believed God was up to something bigger and Daniel wanted to be a part of it. Today we, we look at that thought, God is up to something bigger and he wants us to be a part of it. And not only does he want us to be a part of it, he wants our children to to be a part of it. He wants our grandchildren to be a part of it. And so if that is true, if God's up to something bigger and he wants our children and our grandchildren to be a part of what he's doing in this world, the question begins becomes, how do we prepare our children and grandchildren to join God in what God is doing that is bigger in this world? So we look at the idea today of parenting for God's bigger purpose. And I want to invite you today to look at the story of Timothy. And if you've got your copy of the Word of God, if you want to find the book of 2 Timothy, we'll get to that text in, in a moment. I'll, I want to try to connect some dots this morning. So I want us to look at the life of Timothy. Timothy was a young man who was certainly involved in the bigger thing that God was doing in the world. He got to be a part of that. And we're going to read some scripture today that talks about some of the challenges that he went through and and what he needed to be prepared to join God in God's greater purpose, and to kind of reverse engineer from that, knowing that this was how Timothy joined God in his bigger purpose, and knowing that this is what his struggles were, going back to the question of then how, as his parents, should have been working to prepare Timothy to be a part of God's bigger purpose, if that makes sense. And just to think of the idea that if the story of Timothy we're about to read, if God's going to call our child or our grandkids into that kind of life, how should we be preparing them? Is there something that we can learn out of the life of Timothy today? So let me just give you a summary of, of Timothy's life. I don't know how much you know about Timothy. We, we first meet Timothy in Acts chapter 16. Timothy grows up in this little bitty city of Lystra. Uh, there's not a whole lot of Jews in the city of Lystra. Uh, it's not even a big enough to have a synagogue in the city, so it's a small village. He, his father is a Greek, a Gentile, a non-Jew, a, a non-believer. His mother is a Jew, so he kind of grows up in this, this mixed household. Uh, but his mother takes responsibility for raising Timothy in, uh, in the Jewish faith. So particularly, that meant that uh, a Jewish child was supposed to be taught the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, by the time that they were the age of five. Because there was no synagogue in that city, that means that Timothy's mother takes responsibility of that in making sure that Timothy understood those scriptures even as an early child. We're not exactly sure how Timothy's mom and Timothy's grandmother come to faith uh, as Jews and believe in that Jesus is the promised Messiah, but we know that they do, and somewhere along the way, Timothy does as well. We, we, we meet Lystra in the book of Acts when Paul arrives in Lystra on the first missionary journey. So, you know, these mission trips that Paul takes, the little colored maps in the back of your Bible. So on, on the first trip, he hits Lystra. And some interesting things happen in Lystra. Paul and Barnabas arrive in Lystra, and there is a crippled man there at the gate, and Paul heals the man in the name of Jesus. The city folk think that Paul and Barnabas are Zeus and Hermes who have come to the flesh. And so they pull out a bull and the priest of Zeus, and they're trying to sacrifice a bull to Paul and Barnabas. And it's all they can do to say, don't sacrifice a bull to us. They're trying to preach the gospel, but the best they can get them to do is just don't kill the bull. We're not Zeus, we're not Hermes. So the city is raptured in the, the worship of Zeus and Hermes. We see that in Lystra. And then a little bit later in the same visit, so Paul has been traveling through all these cities, and he's been telling people that Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah, and he's encouraging Jews to believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And right behind Paul is coming a, a, another group of Jews saying, forget everything that Paul said, forget everything that Paul said, forget everything that Paul said. Well, they follow Paul to Lystra, 
But they don't just say, forget everything that Paul says. They actually drag Paul out of town and they stone him to death. At least that's, they left him for dead. It's an interesting scene. It says the believers gathered around him and he was raised up. Now whether he had actually died and they brought him back to life or whether he was just near death and he was healed instantly, there was some dramatic event that happens outside of Lystra. Paul gets up, keeps preaching, uh, and then he's, he's on his way. Now somewhere in all of that, I don't know if if Timothy's mother and grandmother heard the gospel through Paul, uh, and if Timothy heard it through Paul, or uh, his mother and grandmother were safe first, and then they led Timothy to faith, but somewhere in all of that, Timothy and his mom and his grandmother are brought to saving faith. The next time that Paul comes to Lystra on the second missionary journey, he comes to Lystra, and at this time it says he meets at Lystra a disciple by the name of Timothy, who is well spoken of by the church, and God prompts Paul to invite Timothy to join him on his missionary journey. So just five things I want you to know about Timothy before we come to our text that we're going to read. First thing is, Timothy joins Paul on the missionary journeys from here on out. So for the rest of Paul's journeys, Timothy is a co-missionary with Paul. The second thing is that Timothy co-writes some of the scriptures. So he, he co-writes Philippians, he co-writes Colossians, Paul and Timothy writes. So I just I say that to let you know, Timothy was not just the baggage handler on the mission trips. I mean, he was a co-missionary with Paul. He actually wrote some of the scriptures that you read. Third thing is, on the missionary trips, there were several times that Paul sends Timothy on these very uh, important missions. So they'll be on a mission trip, and, and Paul will say to Timothy, you know, I need you to go, go back to Thessalonica and check on the church. And so he'll go to Thessalonica. One time he sends him to Corinth. And of course, if you read 1 Corinthians, that church was messed up. They had immorality problems, doctrinal problems, division problems. They were fighting about everything. They were suing everything, suing each other. And so Paul sends Timothy to Corinth, straighten out that mess. And it doesn't go well. It blows up in his face. And whether that's because Timothy mishandled it or it didn't matter who Paul sent, uh, you know, Jesus himself, it would have blown up. Who knows? You know, but it, was, it, was a, it did not go well for Timothy in Corinth. Uh, so that's so he gets sent on some very important assignments. The fourth thing to know about Timothy is at the end of Timothy's life, Timothy is the bishop or is the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Uh, so after the missionary uh, journeys come to an end, Timothy goes to Ephesus and he is the pastor of the, of the Ephesian church and that's where he ends his life. And so the fifth thing to know about Timothy, even though the, the scriptures do not tell us how Timothy dies, tradition has it that Timothy is in his 80s He's the pastor there in Ephesus, and Ephesus has this huge temple to Diana, to Artemis, both of those names are applied to her. It's this pagan temple, and there was a procession headed up towards the pagan temple, and Timothy was standing by the procession. He's in his 80s, he's the pastor of this church, he's preaching the gospel to the procession. The processional crowd gets ticked off, and they stone him to death at the side of the road. That's how tradition tells us that Timothy Timothy dies. So that's kind of the, the quick story of, of Timothy. Uh, I would like for you to read with me these two passages. This is from 2 Timothy. So this is a letter that Paul writes to Timothy. It's at the end of Paul's life, and it's, the, it's at, the, at the tail end of Timothy's life as well. Timothy very well could be in his 70s or 80s as Paul was writing this letter to Timothy, Okay. So if you read with me, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, the faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Lord Christ, 
Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know that whom I have believed, I am convinced he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. So follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus and by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And also in the third chapter of the same letter, beginning in verse 10, Paul continuing to write to Timothy, You, Timothy, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from all of them the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So what I'd like to do this morning is taking the life of Timothy, how we see that God was up to something bigger, and how Timothy got to be a part of that, and these words from the Apostle Paul, and to re-kind of retro-engineer the idea, reverse-engineer the idea of how then should Timothy's parents have been involved in preparing Timothy to be involved in this greater purpose, and what can we learn from that as well. Now, what's interesting is we find out in Timothy, uh, we think probably Timothy's father, biological father, died early on in the process. Probably he lived with his mother who and moved in with his grandmother, We're guessing that just from what we read. Uh, But Paul sees himself as Timothy's spiritual father. Five times in the scriptures, Paul calls Timothy my son, my child in the faith. So we get this insight both from Timothy's biological mother and biological grandmother and also from Timothy's spiritual father. So not only what we're talking about here is how, how we prepare our biological children and grandchildren to be involved in God's bigger purpose, but also any role that you have in mentoring or coaching or training, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a WANA teacher, if you work with our student ministry, if you have anyone, a child that you have an influence in their life, these are things that can speak into your life as well. How do we help the people around us who are going to be called into God's greater purpose, how do we prepare them for that? So let me just give you some uh, ten, a list of ten things here come out of this. Um, we'll try to go quick if you'll try to listen fast, okay? So number one, pr- uh, we learn for parenting for God's greater purpose. Number one, pray for them daily. Pray for our children, pray for our grandchildren daily. Now, I, I know this is something that we all know, we all believe to be true, and we all would agree that we're supposed to be doing it. I won't ask for a show of hands. How many of you pray daily for every one of your children and for your, your grandchildren? There are a lot of things in life. I saw a couple of hands. That's good. There are a lot of things in life that we know we should do. Prayer is, prayer is a challenge. Your prayer life may be further advanced than mine, and I hope it is, but prayer for me is spiritual battle. It is difficult. It is the, the thing that falls off the list the easiest, and we have to work to discipline ourselves and to focus and to make sure that every day, praying for our child's salvation, praying for protection from the enemy, praying for their faith to mature, praying for the Spirit to guide their steps, praying for the fruit of spirit, of character within them, uh, praying for that they would have wisdom, praying that they would have a pure heart, just praying over them day and night. If, if you want your children and grandchildren to be involved in God's greater purpose, pray for them daily. Number two, ground them in Scripture. Ground them in Scripture. Here we see uh, Timothy's mother taking personal responsibility to make sure that her child knew the Scriptures. Again, in in the Jewish 
way that, of raising kids. It was your responsibility to make sure that the, your child knew the Torah by the time they were the age of five. That's the first five books of the Old Testament. Typically, the synagogue would help you in that, but, but since there wasn't a synagogue in Lystra, that meant that Timothy's mother had to take sole responsibility for that and to make sure that her son knew the scriptures, and she did that. I think this reminds us that we need to be as committed to our spirit, the, the spiritual education of our children as, to we, as we are to the secular education of our children. It's amazing. We are committed to having our kids at school five days a week. We have them there on time. Lunch is made. We make sure their homework is done. We make sure science fair projects are done. We get them to baseball practice on time and violin lessons on time and volleyball games on time and peewee football. We, we get them to all of these things. And yet when it comes to their spiritual education, it becomes kind of this semi-optional kind of involvement. We need to be as committed to the spiritual education of our children as we are to the secular education of our children. I, I, this was referenced in a, uh, a speech that I heard this week. I went back and did the research. There's a recent study that said, that looked at freshmen entering into college. So baby boomers, when baby boomers were freshmen entering into college, they self-reported that 62% of them said that they went to a Sunday school or some other religious education program weekly. 62% of baby boomers, when they were freshmen, entering into college, said they, they went to Sunday school weekly. Millennials, the millennial generation, as they are freshmen in college, only 40% say that they've been going to Sunday school weekly. Now, some of you are probably surprised that it was as high as 40%, but that's a 20% drop-off in a generation. And what's going to happen in the generation that comes behind, behind the millennials? So here's a, here's a group of students whose parents are committed to their education. They're sending them to college. They're paying great money for their college, but they're not paying the same kind of attention to their spiritual education. Parents, let me just encourage and challenge you. If you want your children to be involved in God's greater purpose, take seriously the responsibility to spiritually educate them and to weekly Sunday school and Awana attendance. So part of the value of Sunday school, part of the value of Awana, is that these programs systematically teach Scripture to children. So there's a system, there's a, there's a plan. They, there's, someone has set out and worked out how do three-year-olds learn and what can three-year-olds get at this time and what do four-year-olds get and what are second graders and, and how do we get them through the entirety of Scripture as they grow up in this place. And I, I'm not saying that Sunday school is the end all be all. You just drop them off at Sunday school and that's the end of it. But if you'll take them to Sunday school weekly and there's a systematic education, it gives you the bare bones that you can work with as a parent. And so when there's a situation in life and the story of David and Goliath applies to that situation, you don't have to go back and retell the story for the first time. They've heard the story. You get to come along and say, now you know the story of David and Goliath. This situation is a lot like that and begin to put the, the, the muscle and, and the, the skin around the skeleton that, that Sunday school in Awana has given to your kids. You always ask the question, should I, should I make my kids go to church? Do you make your kids go to school? Well, my child says that school is boring and I don't want to turn him against education, so I just decided not to allow him to go to school. The state of Texas knows that's foolishness. That's why you're not allowed to do that. There's a law. It's a compulsory education. So take responsibility for the spiritual development and education of your children. And, and as you're teaching Scripture to your kids, remember, not, don't just teach your kids the facts of the Bible, but make sure you're teaching your kids why the Bible is profitable. Teaching correction, training in righteousness, equipping for good work. Show your children how, how the scriptures teach you what is true. How the scriptures can correct you of your behavior and your attitude and your character. How they can train you for righteousness, which is not just following rules, but it's a right relationship with God, what that looks like and how the scriptures help for that. How the scriptures equip you for the good work God's created you 
to do. So don't just teach them the facts of the Bible, but teach them how it's profitable. So number two, ground them in Scripture. Number three, present the gospel as both life and immortality. As both life and immortality. So in verse 10, it says that that Jesus Christ has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And by that, I, I mean to say that as we talk to our kids about faith, Don't just talk about we get to go to heaven when we die, but also talk about that Jesus has come to give us life and give it life more abundantly. Make sure that both of those concepts are being taught as you taught about what it means to be a follower of Christ to your children and to your grandchildren. Not only are we looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth, but in the here and the now, God is at work. And if you want to have life, and if you want to have abundant life, then follow the path of life that Jesus lays out before you. Just make sure that both of those ideas are being presented as you talk about the gospel. Number four, give them an example to follow. Give them an example to follow. It's interesting that twice in these passages that we read, in verse 13 of chapter 1, Paul said to Timothy, follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me. Or in chapter 3 and verse 10, follow my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my per- on and on. Give them an example to follow. And your example has three things to it. Number one, it has, has the, what you believe to be true. It has to do with truth. Second thing, it has to do with your character, your conduct, who you are as a person. And the third thing it deals with is your aim in life, as Paul said. So follow my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life. So give your kids an example to follow. As Timothy's spiritual father, Paul lived an example before him and said, follow me. You know what I believe to be true? Believe the same things. You know how I conduct my life? You know the character that you see? Imitate me. I I live my life sacrificially. I lay it down for God's greater purpose. Follow me. Give them an example to follow. The surest way to make sure that your child will not step into God's greater purpose is to tell them to be one thing and you be something else. Our kids have this incredible ability to see through that. I mean, I don't know if you've had this experience, random thought, but as your kids get older and you're sitting around the dinner table and you're just talking, and your kids start talking to each other, describing you, you know, dad's like this, and you go, wait a minute, that's true, but I don't like it. I mean, they are aware we, we may be pretending and hoping that they don't really see who we are, but they see who we are. And the surest way to make sure that they will turn away from the faith is to say one thing or try to encourage them to be one thing and then you be something different. Give them an example to follow. Say, follow me. Number five, give them worldview-ready faith. Worldview-ready faith. So in verse five, Paul talks about the sincere faith that Timothy had, that his mother had and his grandmother had. That word sincere means without hypocrisy, without pretense. It's a faith that was well thought out. It was a faith that they understood. The reason I say give them a worldview ready faith, give them a faith that is able to exist in a world surrounded by competing worldviews. If you've not heard this phrase worldview before, a worldview is just the way you view the world, what is ultimate reality, what is God, who is God, what does it mean to be a follower of God, it's your view of the world. So here's Timothy. Timothy grows up in Lystra. Lystra obviously has a very strong cult of worshiping Zeus and Hermes, that's why they thought that Paul was Zeus incarnate. He also grew up in a culture where the Jewish community, at least some of the Jewish community, stoned to death Paul because Paul believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. He's sent to Corinth uh, on on a task, on a mission. Corinth is known for one of the most pagan cities in the entire Roman world. So they have the hedonism and atheism of Corinth. And then he spends his life pastoring in Ephesus. Ephesus was completely dominated by the temple to Diana, this pagan goddess that the whole city revolved around. He was constantly in different places with different worldviews, and he needed a faith that was ready to survive. He needed a faith that could, could be distinguished between other worldviews and why he believed what he believed. Look, if, if you're parenting your children and your grandchildren for God's greater purpose, you've got to just anticipate the fact that God's going to send them somewhere with a competing worldview. Are they ready? For instance, a third of the world 
are followers of Hinduism. Hinduism is a belief that there are uh, multiple gods, thousands of gods. Uh, Hinduism is the belief in karma and reincarnation. And hopefully as you go through the reincarnation process, you're getting higher and higher and higher. And ultimately to the point the goal is to escape reincarnation so that you can be absolved into the absolute uh, reality called Brahma. That's the goal of life in Hinduism. Are your children ready to be launched into a workplace where they're going to share a cubicle with someone who is a follower of Hinduism? Are they ready to go to college where they may be assigned a roommate who is a, a Hindu? Are they ready to move somewhere where their next door neighbor is going to be a Hindu? Are they ready to, to go to India and work as a banker there as a, as a light for the gospel and be surrounded by that culture? Do they have a faith that is worldview ready? It's your responsibility to make sure they understand their faith, what makes it distinctive from other worldviews, and why they should believe what they believe. Give them a worldview ready faith. Number six, give them a persecution ready faith. A persecution ready faith. Isn't it interesting how many times in the passage that we read that Paul talks about suffering? It says in verse 8 of chapter 1, share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. It says in, in chapter 3, verse 12, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This idea of sufferings and persecutions and afflictions. We need to give our children persecution-ready faith. In other words, if you tell your children, if you'll follow Jesus, then you get to live in this little God bubble, and your life will be spared from any difficulties and any trials, and God will watch over you, and everything will go well. That's what Jesus' life is like. If you're telling them that or giving them the illusion of that, you're not preparing them for the real world. We need to give our children persecution-ready faith faith. We need to teach them that they are joining a battle for the ages. We need to give them a theology of suffering. Folks, your, your kids are going to experience suffering somewhere, somehow. Are you giving them a theology of suffering? Are you giving them a theology of spiritual warfare? Or are they ready to, to be launched into God's greater purpose, realizing that the spiritual forces of darkness are going to assail against them are they ready? Are they prepared for that? Are you letting them know as you follow Jesus, there will be persecutions and afflictions and tribulations and sufferings. This is part of what it means to be a Jesus follower. Give them persecution ready faith. Number seven, connect them to the church. Connect them to the church. So we meet Timothy. He was well spoken of by the church in Acts 16.1. What happens when Paul says, I want you to join me on my missionary journey, the council of elders lay hands on Timothy from the church and they send him out. And he spends the backside of his life as a pastor uh, in the church in Ephesus. Your, your children, your grandchildren, they, odds are they're not going to serve as missionaries and serve as pastors. But make sure that they have a lifelong connection with the body of Christ. Make sure they understand the depth and the value and the significance and the reason why the church gathers together in worship, why the church gathers together in fellowship, why the church gathers together in prayer, why the church comes together in ministry and in missions. Give them a, an understanding of the significance of the church. Model that before them. Unfortunately, many parents are raising their kids that the church is optional, the church is is something extra. If we get around to it, we'll, we'll be a part of that. Grant, connect your kids to the church. Look, at, if you want your child or grandchild to be a part of what God is doing that's so much larger in the world, what's larger in the world is the body of Christ. What's larger in the world is the eternal body of Christ that we call the church. Work to connect your child to the church. Number eight, teach them perseverance. Teach them perseverance. Paul wrote to Timothy and, and said in chapter 3, verse 14, continue in what you have learned. And he was talking about in verse 14 or verse 13 before that, evil people and postures will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned. Timothy was prepared for difficult service. When you look at the life of Timothy, he 
he might have been gathered around Paul when they stoned him and left him for dead in Lystra the first time, but he was certainly with Paul in all of his experiences. He spent time in prison. We know this from the book of Hebrews. Uh, he, he went to, on hard assignments. He had to face opposition. He had to endure failure. He had to endure hardship. He had to endure conflict. And so if we're going to prepare our children to be part of God's greater purpose, we've got to prepare them and teach them perseverance. Teach them how to go through difficult circumstances and how to continue and how to endure and how to be steadfast. If they don't have perseverance, they won't be able to join God and God's greater purpose because God's greater purpose is, is going to be difficult and there's going to be opposition from the spiritual forces of darkness. So teach them perseverance. Number nine, lead them to be eternally teachable. Lead them to be eternally teachable. One of the things that is interesting about 2 Timothy, uh, I mean, so here's, here's Paul at the end of his life. Timothy has already traveled with Paul on the mission field. He has, is a co-writer of Scripture. He's now a pastor in the church in Ephesus. And he's, he's 70s or 80 years old at the end of a lifetime of ministry. And yet Paul writes things to him like, Fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. God's not giving you a spirit of fear. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I mean, can you imagine me writing these words to Billy Graham today? Billy Graham, I just want you to know God's not giving you a spirit of fear. I want you to know, Billy Graham, fan into flame the gift that God has given to you. Don't neglect the gift of preaching, Billy Graham. Uh, Billy Graham, don't be ashamed of Jesus. I mean, can you, can you imagine me writing that to Billy Graham and how Billy Graham might receive that? What are you talking about? I've spent my entire life doing all of these things. Yet, instead of being offended that someone might try to teach him the basics of what it means to be a follower of Christ, Timothy received them with a teachable spirit. And here's Paul, here's Paul write to him, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. That's right. I should not be ashamed about the testimony of our Lord. In fact, tomorrow there's going to be a procession up to the pagan temple for Diana. I'm not going to be ashamed of the testimony. I'm going to go stand by the roadside and I'm going to preach the gospel. He had a teachable spirit. Teach your children to be teachable. There's something about our sin nature that when, when someone tries to teach us, our initial reaction is, I know, I know, I know, I know. I mean, those words come out of our mouth before the person even finishes the sentence. To say, I already know that. I don't, I don't have anything to learn. Instead of having a teachable spirit throughout the end uh, of your life. I'm always amazed. There are so many mature saints in our church. I've been following Jesus longer than I've been alive. And after... Sunday morning worship and after sermons will come up to me and say, I, I really, really appreciate you helping us see what the scripture said about this. And I'm thinking, you could have preached that so much better than I could have preached it. But the, the saints who have a teachable spirit to say, I still want to learn, I still want to grow, I still want to mature, I still want to hear. Teach your kids to have a teachable spirit. That's hard work. Number 10, help them discover their good work. Help them discover their good work. So Paul writes to Timothy and says in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, that we have, God's called us to a holy calling. Saved us, that's verse 9, called us to a holy calling. Now Timothy's holy calling was to be a missionary, was to be a pastor. Odds are very great that, that your child and grandchild's holy calling is not going to be to be a missionary and to be a pastor. But that does not mean they don't have a holy calling. Ephesians 2 says that we are God's workmanship. God has created us in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. So over your child's life, saturate this language. They've been created for a good work. They've been created for a holy calling. It may be to be a teacher. It may be to be an accountant or a plumber or a nurse or an engineer or a home builder or an office assistant. It's not necessarily tied to their career that they do, but there is a good work that God has created them to do. Begin to speak that over them from the very beginning of their life so that as they're thinking about 
college? How does, how does college fit into the good work God's called me to do? How does this job opportunity fit into the good work that God's called me to do? How does moving here or moving there, how does all of that fit into what God has called me to do? Help let our children know, let your grandchildren know they are special, they are unique. God has created them individually, and there is a good work that God wants to do through them. They're not just a random life on this planet. Help them to know that there is a good work and help them discover that. Coach them through that process. So let me give you some uh, invitations, action steps today. Parents, grandparents, in the, the information desk, there is this folder out there that Aaron has put together for us. It's called Parenting as Part of God's Greater Purpose. And there's a, uh, quite a bit of resources is in uh, that envelope. One of the things that's in there that you'll find is a time audit. So uh, it's easy for us to say, oh yeah, I believe that to be true and I value that. Uh, but when you start auditing your time of how you actually spend your time, you realize, wow, I don't give much time to what I say I really believe to be true. So there's a, a time audit to challenge you in that. There's also some specific uh, things about faith formation based upon the age of your kids. So if your child is two to five years old, it talks about capturing God moments and using God moments as a way to do uh, preparing your kids for God's greater purpose. If they're five to nine year olds, if they're nine to 14 year olds, even talks as your kids get older about how to transition from being a teacher to being a coach. Uh, and, and I would remind you that this process does not just happen while our kids are under our roof. It's not at, at age 18 we say goodbye to them. I no longer have any, any influence on you at all. As many of you realize, sometimes your influence goes up dramatically after they've left the house. Is it Mark Twain who said, when I was 15, I thought my dad was a moron, and I was surprised how much he'd learned in three years. There's something about becoming an adult where you realize, oh, my five parents may have some wisdom here. Maybe I should value that. Uh, but there's a piece in there as where uh, there's lots of other resources in there. So if you are a parent, or if you have significant interaction with your grandchildren, we invite you to go by the information desk and get that when the service is over on the way to Sunday school. Also, we'd like to invite you to a Faith Path luncheon today. So Aaron is hosting a luncheon in the fellowship hall. It's a catered meal, so it's not potluck. Uh, but there he wants some time to be able to introduce to our parents and to our grandparents the Faith Path. The Faith Path is this resource that we have as a church to guide you through the spiritual development stages of children. So you know if you've got a four-year-old, what are the things you should be focusing on? What should you be looking on? What's the focus at that age? What if they're 14? What should I be focusing on? It's a way of, of kind of going through a path and giving you some resources to, to lead your child so that when they leave out of your house, they are launching into God's greater purpose. That's, that starts at 1230 this afternoon in the fellowship hall. You don't need reservations. We would invite you to go uh, to that as well. But as we close today, I just want to invite you to pray over these, these top tens, top ten lists, uh, and see if there's one that the Spirit might pull off and say, in, in your particular relationship with this child or with this grandchild, uh, or maybe it's with a student that you have that's in your, uh, in your Iwana group or in your Sunday school class, maybe there's a particular one that, that would pull out of that and say, this is where I need to to sow into my child or into my grandchild about this particular area. And may God lead you and guide you through that. Would you pray with me as we pray together?